I'm a pro registered professional engineer in Indiana, uh, former director of in engineering with the Department of Natural Resources. And what I want to do, I'm a conservationist also, but I want to talk about this project strictly from an engineering term and from practical problems that I perceive as an engineer and a project manager. Uh, first of all, just a map of it that you've seen other versions of. Uh, this is one that uh, does show where the Mounds Park is, and there's several other local parks in green. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about the justification for the reservoir. Uh, the first justification in the phase one study basically was, was economic development. And in my view, that still is the main justification for the reservoir. But because they determined in the early uh, uh, communications with regulatory agencies that it wouldn't fly as strictly economic development, they brought in some other potential uses. Flood control is one that's been mentioned. Um, I will say any dam does have a certain amount of dampening effect on flood controls, and so yes, this dam would have some minimal impact uh, on lessening of the impacts of floods. A true flood control reservoir like Mississippi Reservoir, Salamone, Huntington, and some of the others the core built is uh, almost contradictory to a water supply reservoir, which I'm going to talk about next, because on a flood control reservoir, what you're doing is lowering the water level each year, fall and winter in preparing for the water coming in the following spring. So you're really not, whereas a water supply reservoir, you want to store water. So they're almost contradictory purposes. But yes, this reservoir, being a dam itself, would have some impact on floods. Water supply. Next. Um, want to talk about uh, potential water supply. Uh, Anderson has a good water supply uh, and an excess of water supply. Their uh, groundwater uh, is it's a, a groundwater, and groundwater is better than surface water. Uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit because it has some bearing on some things later. I think most engineers would agree that groundwater is, if you've got a good quality groundwater, there are some groundwaters that, that are not, but if you have a good quality groundwater, it's far superior to surface water because it's more easily treatable. Nature is treating it partly before you ever pull it out of the ground. It doesn't have all the silts and other uh, th things in it that have to be taken out of surface water. It's also a constant water quality because it doesn't vary from day to day or week to week like a reservoir will. So in, in my way of thinking, and, and most engineers and most water supply companies, uh, groundwater is preferable to the surface water. Uh, Chesterfield, uh, Daleville, and uh, Muncie. Uh, uh, so I say Anderson does not need water. Uh, Chesterfield and Daleville and Muncie, uh, and by the way, Yorktown, I, I, you must get your water from Muncie, I, I'm hoping, because I've never saw any reference to that. But as far as I know on these, Chesterfield and Daleville both have groundwater. Ground Muncie has a combination of groundwater and surface water, but and I'm not aware of them having any needs for water. So the discussion has been on Indianapolis and Citizens Energy, uh, which is the one, uh, owner and operator of the water company in Indianapolis now. Citizens Energy uh, has, um, there have been th in some droughts in the past, sometimes where they've had to mm, encourage people not to water their lawns as much and things. And so they're, they're look, they've looked at that issue and they have a very good plan, uh, or they have a, a very thorough plan of looking at options for the future. They have looked at those options and they've decided that their local sources are adequate for the next 35 years. What they are doing is they, uh, they have three reservoirs um, that they draw, can draw water from indirectly, Geist and Morris and Eagle Creek. On Geist and Morris, Geist is actually, uh, they pull water from Fall Creek many miles downstream from Geist. They don't pull directly from the reservoir. And Morris feeds water into White River where they pull water from. But what they're doing is Geist and Morris, they're dredging those reservoirs to increase the capacity. So that's the first thing they're doing. They're also doing a lot of things in, in terms of uh, adding other um, groundwater aquifers where they can put some more wells in. They're acquiring those type of areas and expanding their capacity there. They're doing some conservation things. They're doing a number of things. And like the previous speaker talked, they had 20 things that they were talking about from least to most cost, uh, uh, costly. And, and the worst of those was a regional reservoir. They've also looked at, in 35 years, where would they pull, what would get water from? They looked at drawing water from the Wabash or the Ohio, 
And I'm not familiar with what's on the Wabash, but on the high, I know those are groundwater sources too. They're not talking about pulling directly from the river. And that was estimated at $400 million, uh, which is cheaper than the cost estimate for the Mounds Reservoir. Brookville Reservoir also has 82 million gallons a day of water available uh, for drinking water. When that reservoir was built, it was built with a plan that it could be used for a drinking water supply up to 82 million gallons. Um, okay, so next. So who will buy the water? To me, that's a fatal flaw in the plan as far as water supply. There is no potential purchaser of water from this reservoir for the next 35 years. So some other engineering concerns that I have, uh, um, and I'm not going to go very much into these right here, but construction in developed areas, I was just amazed when I first heard about this that it was planning to build a reservoir in a developed area, in an urban area. Uh, the problems and costs with utilities, roads and bridges, just the disruptions to people's lives. Putting a reservoir in the middle where it used to be easy to get from one place to another and now it's not, depending on how many bridges they actually rebuild. Cost will es es can escalate tremendously. You're already starting to see that in the phase two where it's come up from the phase one, it'll continue to go up. Next. Um, now, geology, I'm going to talk about in more detail on some of these coming up. The geology, uh, to, uh, you, you know, granular materials can be a problem with a dam. If you think about it, it makes sense. You're, you're holding, wanting to hold this water supply behind the dam, and if you've got sand and gravel deposits underneath, it can go right through those. So you can get piping under the dam uh, and just leakage out of the reservoir. Uh, they're starting to look at that in the phase two uh, report, and they have evaluated some uh, areas of sand and gravel where the dam is going to be and they are looking at uh, piping uh, preventing that so they're taking an engineered solution to it but in that phase two report this was taken straight from the report figure 216 from the u.s geological survey anderson sand and gravel resources all here's the reservoir all of these dark orange areas are potential mineable sand and gravel resources. <laughs> if I was the engineer in charge of this project, I would not be, this would cause me to lose sleep at night. I would have nightmares about this. Why would you put a reservoir right where you've got sand and gravel resources like that? So uh, two, a couple of slides I borrowed from uh, Tony Fleming, our next speaker, uh, just to show in, in, uh, schematically what happens here. When you've got your White River now, you've got, and this is not based on any actual soil boring. This is general. Some uh, sand and gravel uh, areas are connected, some are not. But basically, you get your groundwater flows, some of them down from the side, like the, some of the seeps in Mount State Park, uh, up underneath and into the river. And, and then, after, if a reservoir is built, next, you get a surcharge in the water, and you start getting that water going the other direction. You get some of that, and what you also get is water that would have drained into it doesn't drain as well anymore because it's got to go far, has to go farther. So it's going to change the groundwater area around there quite a bit. So moving on from geology, um, another engineering concern is the unprotected drainage area in this. Um, Department of Natural Resources, where I was, we had, I think it's 82 dams large enough to be regulated by the uh, Division of Water. Um, but most of those dams uh, um, are on small, smaller areas, have protected areas. If you want to build a dam, what you want to do is to build it on a smaller tributary or something with a relatively protected area so that you don't get a lot of silt and other materials coming into it that will lead to uh, silting in a, of the reservoir itself. Uh, a lot of the area upstream from this reservoir is agricultural, as you're aware which means you will get a lot of runoff, agricultural chemicals, algae blooms, all of that, the chemicals include fertilizers. All of that will lead to algae blooms, which I might add groundwater is not subject to algae blooms, another example of how it's superior. And dredging is expensive. Uh, in the phase two report, they talk about putting a low head dam in the upper reaches of the reservoir. And from a strictly engineering standpoint, that's probably a good idea because they're recognizing that it will need to be dredged. However, that is going to need to be dredged on a regular basis, not just every 
Uh, I mean, I don't know how often it's going to have to be dredged, but it, if it works like it's supposed to, they will be to be dredging that a lot. Uh, another engineering concern I have is terms of cost estimates that are not in there or that are going to go up. The biggest thing that I see that's not in that, right now they're estimated at $440 million. That does not include anything for administrative design and construction management fees. And unfortunately, I noticed at the beginning of this slide, I did not update this from, I, I updated my program, but this is not my latest uh, program that I, I've got here, or my latest presentation. Uh, it's actually 110 million now. I talked to another engineer with a firm today about uh, construction administration fees and stuff, and we both agreed that 25% would be a reasonable figure to use on this project for the, all of these figures. Because when we're, when we're looking at design fees on a project, we usually start at ballpark as a 10% of the construction cost. If it's a bigger project, you go down from that. If it's a more complicated project, you go up. If you're going to have a lot of construction uh, administration uh, during construction, instead of just weekly inspection, which this will have a lot of, you go up even more. Uh, for federal highway projects, they indicate that they recommend 15% of the construction cost uh, for um, uh, just construction administration. So between design, uh, construction, purchase of properties and all that, 25% easily. So $110 million is what I would estimate right now for all those, and this is not included in that. So we're already up to, instead of $440 million, $550 million. Airport relocation. They're going right up to the edge of the runway on that airport now. I'll admit, I haven't had no experience with airports uh, relocation, but from what I understand, that may not be acceptable for that airport to operate that way, and it may have to move to a different location. That is not in this now. It might be after the next phase of the study, if there is another phase. Legal fees, and I'll get to that in a little bit. So, as a project manager, the first thing you want to do is build according to codes. If it's a building you're building, you build according to the building codes. If it's a, a, a site project you're building, you look at what all, all the regulatory approvals you need and find out what you need to do, and you build according to those. Without going into detail, some of the agencies involved here is Corps of Engineers, Section 404 permit, EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Department of Natural Resources, and Department of Environmental Management. They held early, DLZ held early coordination meetings with these agencies. And they included the letter from DNR in the Phase Two report. They did not include a copy of the letter from the EPA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in their report. We have copies of those here that were on the table when you signed in, but I'm going to quote from those letters. These are the people that can say whether the project will be permitted or not. They said, the proposal appears to skip the important step, step of developing a range of alternatives. You're supposed to, for these permits, look at the different options. And instead, they said, this is what we want to do and we're going to justify it. They didn't look at those. They said that you uh, you, you're going to need to do that. You're going to need to look at those options. Uh, that it must comply with, and they gave the specific section of the Clean Water Act, which includes there must be no practicable alternative which would have less adverse impact on the aquatic ecosystem. They also went on to say, it appears unlikely that proposal of a dam and reservoir would be determined to be the least environmental damaging practicable alternative. The regulatory agency that can say yes or no to this project, they said in that letter, we don't think you can uh, approve it. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, again, that it has to comply with those requirements. Uh, they concur with the EPA that the proposed dam and reservoir project is unlikely to be the least environmentally damaging practical alternative. A second regulatory agency said, we don't think you can prove it. Fatal flaw. <laughs> if, if I was a consulting engineer with a client at this point in time, I'd say to my client, I really don't think this is a wise use of your money to keep going doing with this. If, if you want us to continue the phases, we would, but I would tell my client, this is not going to work. Nature Preserves Act that Lee was talking about, and this is the same wording you saw a minute ago, but I want to just quickly repeat part of it again. Uh, after finding by the commission the existence of an imperative and unavoidable public necessity, 
for the other public use. And the fatal flaw. This is not unavoidable uh, imperative. Here's the, in 2050, when Citizens Energy says they will need additional water supplies, the options are Wabash or Ohio River, which they estimated at $400 million, Brookville Reservoir, I've never seen an estimate on that, but it's closer than the Ohio River, so I said $350 million. Um, other central Indiana groundwater sources, Mounds Reservoir at $520 million plus, Okay, yeah, again, this is the old figures because uh, I didn't, I don't have my current. It's 550 now. Which is the least damaging practicable alternative? I don't know about these, but it sure isn't this one. Is there an imperative and unavoidable public necessity? No. Uh, I remember. Oh, so what does this mean? It, it means you can proceed through all the studies and design and spend millions of dollars of taxpayer money and the regulatory agencies can still say, no, you can't do it. You just wasted millions of dollars. Now, what if I'm wrong? What would happen if the permits were granted and the nature preserve was decertified? I think both unlikely, but what if they did happen? Lawsuits. Because the, particularly the Nature Preserve Act is so critical. Like Lee said, it's never been tested uh, or, or, or in, in terms of this way. If, if this shows that it can be that easily uh, decertified, that, then no nature preserve in the state is, is safe. So conservations all over the state are gonna join and there'll be lawsuits on both of these issues. Years of delay and I'm not a, a lawyer and actually I changed my final version saying probable defeat because I'm not a lawyer and I shouldn't say that, but I. That's my personal view as a non-lawyer. Non <laughs> so this project doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, actually, I'm not sorry, but I mean, I think that's the end of my presentation. <laughs>